All righty. Well, we are reached the final session in our questions to God discussion. And the question that we're going to look at right now needs no introduction. Because I told you all before about the different questions and how they are the most common questions that I get. This question, I wouldn't say is the most common one I get, but it's by far the most common one that people ask. And any survey on the street of people asking questions for God, this is your number one. And this is the question that people ask even if they don't ask it. And like I kind of told you all yesterday, is that usually when you find people who say they don't believe in God, or they don't want to get close to God, or God may be good for you, but I don't want to have anything to do with God in my own life, the bottom line, like the root cause of it, is they don't know how to answer this question. Because so often in life, we believe in God, we trust in God, we hear a sermon about praying, and then our grandma gets sick, and we go and pray to God, and she dies. Or so-and-so a uh, bad man comes into my family and uh, destroys my family and breaks my parents apart and my family is destroyed and we didn't do anything wrong and why, God, did you allow this to happen? If we're honest, this is a question that we can't really answer. Because if you look around at the world that we live in, there's a lot of evil. And there's a lot of bad stuff. And unfortunately, the bad stuff doesn't seem to discriminate, as we so often wish it would, and just choose to go to the bad people. Usually when people go into schools and start shooting, they don't choose only the bad people to shoot. Usually it's the good people. Usually when tsunamis hit and earthquakes hit, they don't go around the good people's homes. Unfortunately for us, we live in a world all you got to do is turn on the news. Okay, this is why, personally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big news kind of a guy because I, it's just depressing sometimes. But all you see is about evil and suffering and hardship. And you hear about famines and you hear about suffering and you hear about wars and you hear about uh, genocides and you hear about terrorists and all that kind of stuff. And let's be honest, you don't even need to look very far. Like, I just said all that stuff. Forget about all that stuff. Just look around at a local level. Look around at your neighborhood. Look around at your church community. You'll find and you'll see suffering all the time. You'll see, like I said, kids growing up without a dad. You'll see wives who are terrified every day when their husband comes home from work. You will see people who can tell you stories, horrible stories, about how they've been abused by a father, an uncle, an older brother, whatever it may be. You'll see people that just see prejudice in this world. Like the evil isn't just restricted to what's on CNN. The evil is what we live. And if we're honest, if we're honest, because we're going to be honest here tonight. You know why we really struggle with the question of why does good, bad stuff happen to good people? Earthquakes, we don't care about earthquakes. Poor kids in Uganda, we don't care about poor kids in Uganda. My neighbor down the street, uh, homeless, we don't care about neighbor homeless, lose job. We don't care about any of that stuff. You know what we care about? We care about me. But it sounds selfish to say I care about me. So what I say is the poor kids in Uganda. And God, you're not fair to the poor kids in Uganda. What I'm really trying to say is, God, you're not fair to me. Because if God solved my problem, I wouldn't care so much about the poor kid in Uganda. Sorry. We don't care why God isn't answering their prayer. We answer, care why God isn't answering my prayer. Why am I still lonely? Why, God, did you allow this disaster to happen to my family? Why, God, did you allow my uncle to do this? Why, God, did you allow my grandma to be the one who suffers this? We care about what happens in our own lives, our own job, our own marriage. So if you've ever asked the question, why does bad stuff happen to good people? Again, kind of like I talked about last night when it comes to unanswered prayer, is you're not alone. You're in good company. Jeremiah the prophet said the following in Jeremiah 12, 1. He said, why does the way of the wicked prosper? And why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Why is it, let me translate this to modern times. Why is it that the girls who dress the worst get married, and I'm still here single? Why is it the people in the office who cheat and lie and stab people in the back, they're the ones who seem to be the most successful ones? Why is it the people who don't pray, who don't go to church, seem to have a perfect life, and here I am, I go to church every Sunday, and my life is miserable? Why, Lord, do the wicked prosper and the righteous seem to suffer? 
This is what we're going to try to break down here today. Okay, and if you think that uh, I'm going to give you an easy answer, this is no easy answer to this. So I'm going to do, okay, kind of what I, what, I, what I normally do, those who kind of follow how I, I, I usually approach these things, is I, I tend to be very, you know, structured and systematic and kind of take it step by step right here. So the first thing that we need to do before we get into any of my notes right here is we need to understand where does this, I, why does this bother us so much that bad stuff happens to good people? Why does it bother us so much? Like, let's be honest, let's go inside the core. Why does it bother me so much? Like, it doesn't bother me that bad stuff happens to bad people. Let's agree on that. And it doesn't bother me when good stuff happens to good people, especially if I classify myself as a good person. What bothers me is when bad stuff to good people or good stuff to bad people, the inverse of it. Because we like everything to be one plus one equals two. One plus one equals two. And you know who we like to be the judge of good or bad? Ourselves. So we like to judge, mm, no, mm, no. Uh, that one's okay, but no, bad and bad and bad. But good right here. And usually the line, the line of the separation between good and bad, usually the line is just one step below me. So wherever you put yourself on the spectrum of good and bad, usually the line of where the good stuff should stop happening is just one step below where you are. See, we have this myth. There's a myth that we've all subscribed to it, whether we, uh, whether we vocalize it or not. And the myth is that if we're Christian and we do the right things, then we have a right to be happy. United States of America, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Didn't they make a movie about that, The Pursuit of Happiness? We, have, we, we adopted this myth that, you know what? I do what's right, and I do what I'm supposed to do, and I go to church like a good church boy, and I, and I say my prayers, and I do everything I'm supposed to do, then I have a right. God, it is your job to make me happy. And if I'm not happy, you're not doing your job. We won't admit it. Because it sounds very unspiritual, but it's the truth. The truth, the real truth, is that nothing could be actually further from what our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. See, we say we are his disciples. Well, if we're his disciples, you have to listen to what he taught us. He taught us, I'll get you, I'll get you three verses. I could have brought you 30 verses, but I'm going to stop at just three. John 15, 20, Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted you, they will also, or, I'm sorry, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Next, John 16, 33. We'll come back to this verse later. In the world, you will have tribulation. That's as blunt as he can be. In the world, you will have tribulation where you will not be happy. If you have good cheer, I've overcome the world. We'll come back to that. Book of Acts. St. Paul's preaching one time to a group and he says to them, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. The theme we've been kind of running with since the start has been like God as our Father. So does this make sense? Like does this tie in with what we understand about fatherhood? Would there ever be, like does your father want you to be happy? Yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> I hope. Okay. <laughs> yes, he does. Okay. Whether he says it or doesn't say it, he wants you to be happy. But is that his number one goal for your life, to be happy? See, it could have maybe worked for moms, because a lot of moms, that's all they care about. As long as you've eaten, okay, and you're happy, like that's all moms want. But dads, that's not what dads want. A dad, a certainly, me as a father, I want my children to be happy. That is absolutely a very important thing. But it is not the most important thing. I want my children to be successful. I want my children to be disciplined. I want my children to be mature. I want my children to be wise. I want my children to be more than just happy because I know that all those things will ultimately lead to the eternal happiness and the eternal joy. And that's what I really, really want for them. So as a father, there are times where I will make my child unhappy because I know it's what's best for them. And again, like we talked about last night, no one has any problem with this. What we're going to do here is we are going to ask God, God, why do bad things happen to good people? And I'm telling you, we're not going to get a one-word answer. Because this is a big topic. But what we are going to see, first of all, back up a second. 
Is it okay to ask God, God, why do bad things happen to good people? Even if it's a very selfish like motivation, is it okay to ask our father this question? Yes or no? Yes, maybe. Depends. The question is fine. But what determines whether or not it's okay to ask? Last session I talked about our attitude. How we ask is more important than what we ask. So is there a way to ask this with a bad attitude? God, how come bad things happen to good people? As if God, like, come here and answer to me. Yes, if that's how you're asking, that's bad. But that's not how we're asking. All of us are saying, we're looking up and say, Lord, look, you have a beautiful, look at that beautiful icon right there. Christ with his open arms. That's a beautiful icon. That's all of us doing. We look up tonight and we say, God, we love you. You're our father. We submit everything we have to you. But we're confused. So please, God, can you enlighten us and shed a little bit of light on it? And he may say no. But I believe that tonight together, that we're not going to come up with a one word answer to this question. But if our hearts are submissive to God, then God delights to share with his children. Some things a father can never explain to his child, but some things he can. So what we're going to do is use the brains God gave us and try to figure out logically why do bad things happen to good people and where does the love of God fit into this. And before I give you the answer, let me tell you a story that will set the scene for us. Because it's something that's hard to kind of get into, into a sentence. Once upon a time, I think I was probably 17 or 18 years old at the time. I just started, I'd been driving. Okay, we get our license at 16 in the, in the States. And I'd probably been driving for about a year, maybe a little bit more. So I knew what I was doing driving, but I was still early on in my driving career. I was driving my parents, and we were on our way to some retreat or some whatever for the weekend. Okay, and I was driving. And as we were driving, we are driving through the mountains of Pennsylvania. Have you ever been in the Pennsylvania, like on the Pennsylvania Turnpike? You know, it's like very mountainous. And it's like steep inclines. And sometimes it's like, like in the James Bond movie where you're rounding the turn and whoosh, like right off the cliff. So it's kind of scary, all right? It's kind of scary. So I'm driving, and as you go climb the mountain, the fog starts to pick up. And it was a rainy day, and the fog started to set in. And it was setting in pretty thick. Thick to the point where it was like a little bit stressful in that car. Especially mom in the back seat with a bismasali, 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 bismasali. <laughs> That's not the way to give confidence to your 17-year-old driver's son, okay? <laughs> Here we are driving up this mountain. And it hits a point in time where I really can't see very far ahead. It's raining, it's foggy, it's a little bit scary, but you know what I did? There was two things that I held on to, okay? I couldn't see very far ahead, but I could see the line marker on my side. Okay, I can see the line. <laughs> Is this not supposed to be distracting? Wait. I think that captures my inner. <laughs> I'm driving up that mountain and I really can't see where I'm going. But I held on to two things. Number one, I could see the white marker right here, like the line between me and the edge of the cliff. Okay? I couldn't see how much grass or wood tree I could, but I could see that line, so I hugged that line. All right? I didn't want to go, I could hug that line. And the other thing I saw in front of me was there was a truck, and that truck had bright tail lights. All right? And I could see those lights. And I, I, my, in my mind, all I was thinking was, as long as I follow those lights and I don't cross this boundary, I'll be okay. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when I'm supposed to turn. I'm sticking close to those lights. And as long as I follow those lights, I'm going to end up in the safe place. Well, asking this question, why do bad things happen to good people? I don't have an answer for you because I'm not God and neither are you. But we can discover some markers together. And we can follow some road signs along the way and some boundaries that God has taught us through His Word and through His Spirit, which is inside of us. And we're not going to cross this boundary. We're going to follow these markers and we're going to get to the end and we're going to get to the top. And we don't know exactly how we got there, but as long as we don't cross this boundary, we follow those markers, we trust 
that will get to the top of the mountain and get to the bottom of this answer. St. Paul says that same thing this way. In 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 12, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, meaning when this life is done, then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know just as I am also known. What St. Paul is saying is in this world, in this life, we can know some things. We will never know everything, but we can know some things. And it's kind of like looking through a fog. If we can kind of see like, well, maybe this, or when I know this, and I understand that. So if you kind of put these together, you kind of connect these dots, ah, now I have an answer of why God does bad things, why God allows bad things to happen to good people. Okay? There's our context. Number one, our first marker. Okay, and this, this would be more of the boundary versus the, the, the tail lights in front of us. Our first road marker is that God is not the creator of evil. All right, we're answering the question, why does God allow bad things to good people? Why is there evil? Why is there suffering? Why is there all these bad things? Okay, first thing, let's agree this. God is not the one who created evil. If you've ever asked yourself the question, why would God create the world with evil in it? Like God created the world, why wouldn't God create the world with no evil in it? What's the answer to that question? He did. Genesis 131 says that when God was done creating the world, he saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. Why wouldn't God create a world with no evil? That's a good idea. That's exactly what he did. Okay, so wait a minute. Where did evil come from? Where did evil come from? Where did evil come from? Shout it out. What do you want to say? Where did evil come from? Not the devil. It came from us. Who created evil? Don't say the devil. Because the devil existed in Genesis 1.31. It wasn't the devil who created it. We created it. We created it with our own free will. And yeah, if you want to get technical, Eve and Adam, okay. Man created it. We created evil. It was not a creation of God. It was a product of our free will. And we kind of talked about that several times. And our free will, which God gave to us, I've, I've talked about it a few times, so let me break it down here for you this way to understand this free will thing, because sometimes we get tripped up on free will. Why did God give man free will? Why did God give man free will? Free will is what caused the problem and brought evil into this world. Why did God give man free will? What's the answer? Fill in this sentence for me. God gave man free will out of his blank for mankind. Out of his what? Most people would say love, and love is 100% true, but I got a better word than love. I like to avoid the word love because love means different things. Okay, love is sometimes sweet and kind. Love is sometimes harsh. Okay, love is patient, but love speaks the truth. Like, love has different faces of love. Like, love is a different thing. So which specific part of God's love caused him to create free will and give it to us? I didn't hear anything. Sorry, what? Respect. Who said respect? Very good. Whoever said respect? Very good. That's perfect. Respect. I say that God gave man free will out of not just his love for man, but his respect for man. Why? Because basically what God is saying to us is I do not treat you like a slave. I do not treat you like a dog. If I have a dog, I don't give a dog free will. I tell the dog when to fetch, when to sit, when to, when to eat. I tell him what to do. You are not a dog. You are not a slave. You are not a robot. You are not a creature. You are my son. And as my son, I treat you like an adult. I treat you with respect. And I give you, just like we do with our own kids, right? I say to my own kids, this is your responsibility. Okay, you go do your homework, all right? And it's your responsibility to get it done. And once you get it done, it's your responsibility to pack your backpack. Like, it's your responsibility. I'm not just going to follow you around and say, write this number right, right here, a one. Right here, a six. Right. I, I give you the responsibility because I respect you. I'll hold you accountable to your decision. There's no such thing as free will without accountability. Free will, I can do what I want. Accountability, I will be judged based on what I do. God gave man free will and man created evil out of his own choice. Yes, the devil played a part in it and he tempted him, but you can't blame the devil for it. It wasn't the devil who did it. It was man who created evil with his sin. And the result of man's creation of evil is the world that we live in today. All the evil that you see around you today it's not God's fault. It's man's fault. 
And specifically, why is it man's fault? I would break all the evil in the world into two categories. Okay, there's two kinds of evil in the world today. When we talk about evil, there's two kinds. I would say there is moral evil and natural evil. Moral evil and natural evil. What's the difference between the two? What's natural evil? Natural evil is like I said, that's the earthquakes, that's the hurricanes, that's the tornadoes, that's the tsunamis. That's the fact that this world, as St. Paul says in Romans 8.28, we know that the whole, oh, 8.22, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. The world we live in, all the natural disasters was not how God created it. When God created the world, we as man were the crown of his creation. We were the ones in charge of running the show. We were the ones who were given dominion and authority. So when we fell, all of creation, who was under our authority, fell as well. And the world that we live in today is a fallen world. That's why there's earthquakes, that's why there's hurricanes, that's why there's all these natural disasters. But there's another kind of evil that exists, which is what I call moral evil. Which if we're honest, 95% of the evil in the world is not the natural evil, it's the moral evil. What's moral evil? Moral evil is, moral evil is when you and I make choices, decisions, to sin against God and cause evil in this world. We blame God, we judge God, we complain to God. The bottom line is the majority of evil in this world why is it, like I said, someone gets drunk, gets behind the wheel of a car, hits a kid in the street, and we say, why, God, did you do that? Why, God? God told that boy, don't drink. God told that boy, definitely don't drink and drive. God told that boy's friend, tell your friend not to drink and drive. God told that boy's parents, do not leave your teenage boys at home alone by themselves with alcohol in the house. God did everything in his power except come down and snatch that boy and throw him away to stop the sin from happening and to stop the evil. And the boy does it, and the boy does it, and the boy does it, and we blame God for doing it? Why is there famine in the world? Why is there famine? Why does God allow kids to go hungry? Y'all know the statistic, you've heard it before. Y'all know that this earth, on its own, produces enough food, every human being on it, to have a 3,000 calorie per day diet. Did you know that? So if there are people in this world who are not eating enough food, and are dying of starvation, whose fault is it? our fault because we misused what God gave to us God provided enough food everyone on this earth can eat and eat plenty and in fact for some of us probably be doing us a service to cut down on some of the calories we eat but we're greedy we're selfish we don't care then we blame God for allowing people to die of hunger God gave us the choice that you can do whatever you want with what he has given you. You have two hands. You can use the two hands to hug someone or to punch someone in the face. Your choice. God respects you enough to give you that choice. You have a tongue. You can use that tongue to bless or to curse. You can use that tongue to encourage a friend who's down or to talk about them behind their back. It's your choice. But don't blame God. Don't say everyone's talking about me, God, why you did this. So God is not the author of evil and suffering. God is not the creator of it. Now, with that said, we know God is not the creator of it. Okay, but the follow-up question would be, but didn't God see it coming? Like, didn't God see this coming from the decision to give man free will? Well, yeah, but the whole point of God being love is that there's no such thing as love without free will. Okay, if I force you to love me, that's not really love. That's called a pet. So God had to give man free will in order for there to be true love that exists between God and man. Next question that you might say, okay, if that's the case. If God knew that it would be so bad, let me ask you this. If God knew that it would be so bad and so evil in this world, why did God even bother to create us? Like if God knew that he created us with free will and it would cause a problem, and he said, you know what, there's no benefit to having them with no free will, so why did God even create us? Why would God create us in the first place? If God knew it was going to be such a headache. Parents, you have children. That's what makes you parents. When you had children, did you think there might be a chance that they might cry? 
every now and then? Is there a chance, parents, when you have children, that they might make a mess in the house? Is there a chance they might, like, throw up on the carpet, throw up on the TV, knock the TV over? Is there a chance that those children would one day grow up and say, Mom, Dad, I hate you? Is there a chance of that? Absolutely. So why are you bother? Why do you bother with it? When you see someone who just had a baby, do you say, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know they're noisy and they're messy and they burp and they spit up and I'm sorry. Why do I, as a dad, why did me and Marianne decide we want to have children? Why? Are we crazy? Why? Because we wanted a family. We wanted to have kids. Because when two people love each other so much, the natural expression of that love is to create more love. Is to find a, 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 a avenue where they can pour that love into someone else. That's the natural way that God created us. So God is love. So God desires greatly to have a family. God desires to pour that love onto his children, which is us. So, so sometimes we over-spiritualize, over-analyze. Why God? God wanted a family. God wanted children. And yes, God knew that there's a good chance that many of those children would cause a lot of problems. But he also knew there's a good chance that many of them would say, God, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And I want to do whatever it is you tell me to do because you're a great father. And that gives a father great joy. So you know what God says? He says, you know what? I'm willing to have children. I know they may mess up the house. And I know what, you know what, I could play with the angels and the angels are much, much more organized than these guys. But I want children, I want a family. First thing, road marker. God is not the creator of evil. Man is the creator of evil. And really, the creation of evil came because God loved man so much that he gave him free will and man abused it. God gave us a gift, and we destroyed that gift, and we destroyed the world with that gift. Now, second road sign. God is not the creator of evil, but for sure, God can use evil for good. For sure. How can God use evil for good? You ever seen... Okay, this is, you ever seen a clay, like this clay stuff being made? You ever gone to, like down in Virginia? Okay, I live in Virginia. If you go to like the, the colonial place, okay, they still have like in Williamsburg, they have like this stuff. People like making stuff out of clay. It's fascinating because what you see is a pile of trash in essence, okay, of, of just yuck. And somehow out of the yuck on this side, they have like these statues and these creations from yuck. So they show us the yuck and it's just, it's yuck. Like it's, it's yuck. Like you get this stuff on your shoe, you throw away your shoe, you get a new shoe. And somehow the potter takes the yuck and makes it into something good. The yuck is not good. But the potter can use even the yuck to make something good. And God is that way. How? They give you three ways that God brings good from evil. Number one, a lot of times the greatest evil in the world leads people to repentance. What is the number one day where every church in America, probably in Canada, but I don't know, but I know in America for certain, the one day where every church in America was full to the brim and you couldn't find a parking spot or a seat in any church in all over America? The Sunday after 9-11. The Sunday after 9-11. Churches were packed. Why? Because what do we do when bad stuff happens? We run to God. And I'm not saying God is causing the bad stuff. I'm not saying. We already said that before. But what I'm saying is, you and I both know. Like, let's be honest. At times of prosperity, times of goodness, God is the furthest thing from our mind. Find out when you are closest to God. Look at those times where you were most motivated to get close to God and you will find nine out of ten times it was when a bad thing happened in your life. I'm not saying God causes the bad, but God sees the yuck and God says, okay, you know what? Let me bring something good out of this. St. Paul said it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of this world produces death. 
Pain sometimes, unfortunately, is what it takes to see the error of our ways. Now again, let's go back to our father analogy. Let's make sure this checks out. Would a father ever allow pain to his child so that they would see the error of their ways? Would a father ever allow a child like, for example, I don't know, to fail a test to show the kid that he needs to study next time? Would a father ever allow a child to miss a game to teach him a lesson he needs to sleep early the night before? Would a father, and this one is just fathers, not mothers, allow a child to go to bed hungry to teach him a lesson he needs to eat when it's dinner time? That's fathers only. Okay, we know that one, okay? We know that one does not apply to moms. Yeah, the answer is yeah. Is that sometimes the short-term pain serves a greater good. A wise person once said, God loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. God loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. And sometimes it takes a little pain to get us to change. Second way that God can use evil for good. God can use evil. I know this sounds really strange. God can use evil to make us more like Christ. Now you say, hey, wait a minute. That sounds kind of strange. How can God use bad to make me more like the Holy One? How can God use something which is evil to make me more like the pure man, the purest one on, on this planet? Well, look what St. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 3. He says, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. You know the saying... No pain, no gain, right? Sometimes it takes a little pain to train you and to become a better person. And I have a very specific example for that. And I'm wearing it on my left foot right now. Imagine that you wanted to run a race. Let's say, I don't know, a 10K race. In order to run that 10K race, you need to train. You say, well, the training is hard. If I love you, I would say, I know it's hard, but it's worth it. Because if you don't train, you're going to stink. And sometimes the training, you come home and you say, this is too hard. This hurts too much. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. I want to make it easy. Don't you love me? I say, yeah, I love you. Run. I remember when, uh, when again, back to my, my newlywed days. When I, I said me and Marianne got married in May, and then we went on our honeymoon, and then we went on a, a trip to Egypt, um, like a month after our wedding. All right, uh, it was a trip that like our church was going on a trip to Egypt, and we had both signed up before we got married, and then so we ended up taking like a ten day honeymoon, came back to work for two weeks, and took like a two week trip to Egypt. It was the golden era of our marriage. Okay, it was fantastic. Okay, and we're in Egypt, and we were in the uh, the Sinai. All right, and if you've ever been there, anyone ever climb Mount Sinai? All right, anyone ever? That's it, only? All right, you got to do this thing, go climb Mount Sinai. For those who've never been there, okay? For those who've never been, Mount Sinai where Moses got the thing, okay, over by the Red Sea. <laughs> you go climb Mount Sinai, okay? There was a big group of us, okay, who was going to go. And in order to go, you have to go at like, you know, you start at like 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? Because it takes a while, you want to get up there before the sun rises. And I remember telling Marianne, like, I'm an adventurous person, like, I'm always up for a challenge, especially a physical challenge. But Marianne, not so much. So, good husband, I said, sweetheart, you decide. You want to do it? We can do it. You don't want to do it? That's fine. She said, no, let's do it. I said, okay, but just, like, I'm okay doing it and not doing it. But if we do it, we're going to do it. She said, yeah, you know what? I said, okay, just, la just for my sake, last time, okay? <laughs> if we get on the bus and we start one step up the mountain... We're making it to the top. You with me? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, okay. Okay. We start climbing the mountain. In the beginning, when you start climbing the mountain, you start to kind of go like this, okay, up the mountain. All right, and it gets a little steeper as you get up to the top. And every, like, a third of the way, there's like a rest stop, which basically says, if you struggle this part, you got no shot. You just stay right there, okay? But let's say we had a group of like 30. We lost three or four people at that time. Then you go up in like another third of the way, and there's another stop, and drop another four or five people right there. Okay? And every time, I'm good, supportive husband, like, I love you, sweetheart, like, you want to stop, like, I'm okay. She said, no, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. We get up, for those who have been there, no. The best part of the trip is the very, 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 very end. Okay, you kind of go on like this, like this, like this, like this. Then you get to the very end. 
and it's straight up. And I think it's like, I, I don't remember the number, I want to say like 200 or 250 steps straight up, okay, which is the final push. And the steps, they're like Egypt steps. They're not all the same size, so like a little one and a big one. They're, they're crazy steps, okay? And there's all kinds of warnings that say like, you know, proceed at own caution and like, you know, the heart maker people and all this stuff, pacemakers and all that stuff. And I tell Mary Ann, we're going to do this. And she sees the glimmer in my eye like, I like a challenge, like, I want to do this. So she's like, okay, let's do it. And at that point in time, it's a narrow thing and it's going like this way. So I put her in front of me, okay, and we start climbing the mountain. And people are climbing, people are climbing, and we're climbing, we're climbing, we're climbing. And all of a sudden she's like, I'm tired. I'm like, no, you're not, keep climbing. And she's climbing, we're climbing, we're climbing. She's like, can we take a break? I'm like, no break, keep climbing. <laughs> you ever seen the movie Rocky Ford? You ever seen the movie Rocky Four? So I said, and she's like, okay, I'm tired. And I'm like, no pain, Marianne, no pain. <laughs> That's what they're in Rocky Four. And she's like, oh, but my feet are, no pain, Marianne, no pain. And I'm screaming at her up the mountain. And at one point in time, there was this guy in our group who was like, uh, 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 like probably like 20 years old or 19 or something like that. And he was like this big, strong, husky guy, whatever it is. And he's, he's like huffing and puffing. And he takes a break. And she's like, can we take a break? And I'm like, no break. And she's like, but that guy's taking a break. I'm like, that guy is weak. You keep going, Marianne. We go, go, no pain, no pain. And I'm shouting up the mountain, and I'm screaming up the mountain, and she's tired, and she's sucking wind, and I'm like, no pain, no pain. And we get up to the top of the mountain. We get up to the top of the mountain. There was three people who were in front of us, who were not part of our group, turned around and thanked me. They said, thank you, sir. If it wasn't for your encouragement, we would not have made it up this mountain. <laughs> now. Is it fun in the process? No, it's pain. But is it worth it in the end? Absolutely. And sometimes God sees that for us to be conformed to the image of his son, sometimes a little pain is actually good for us. And some of the things that we classify as evil or as bad as, or as suffering, maybe those things are for our character. Any good character trait that you admire and that you want in life, will never come to you easy. Any character trait that is worth pursuing will never come to you without hardship and a little tribulation and a little old-fashioned sweat. Make us more like Christ. Thirdly, is that God will use evil. And when I say evil, okay, I'm talking about what we classify as evil. Sometimes what we classify as evil is not evil, but for our perspective, bad things, okay? God will use bad things to lovingly discipline his children. Keyword, lovingly. What's the difference between the word discipline and punishment? Sometimes we ask, people ask the question, will God punish us for our bad deeds? Will God punish us? Or God is punishing me for this bad decision? Or this is happening and God is punishing me with this? God does not punish us. Now. Punishment comes later. Now is not punishment, now is discipline. What's the difference? The difference between punishment and discipline is different in the motive. Punishment is to hurt. Discipline is to help. Punishment is focused on what you did. Discipline is focused on what I want you to become. Parents, we don't punish our children, at least I hope not. We don't hurt them because we're angry. We don't hurt them just because we're upset. That's bad. But we discipline our children because we love them. And if you don't see the difference, look at this. Hebrews 12, verse 10 and 11. For they indeed, for a few days, talking about our parents, they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That's why he chastens or disciplines us. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been, to those who have been, trained by it. Some of us need a little training. And that's what God does. He disciplines us. He's not angry at us. Okay, I'm not angry at my children when I say, you have to sleep at 8 o'clock. I'm disciplining them. I'm training them on how to be successful at school the next day. God, see, if you believe in punishment, that's God as judge. And God certainly is judge of the universe. But judgment day is yet to come. Okay, there will be punishment. Like, I'm not trying to water down punishment. There's punishment. That's on judgment day. But until then, it's discipline. It's not judge, it's father. Correction. Focused on the future, not focused on the past. Another example. 
imagine that you go outside and you go into the woods somewhere and you see a bear. And that bear is trapped in a, this kind of a trap, okay? That kind of a thing, okay? You know, from the cartoons, what's it called? Bear, bear trap, okay, silly me. <laughs> <laughs> Should have Googled that one before I came, okay? You know those things that trap bears? Those bear traps, okay? Like this, okay? And for some reason, you in your heart have a soft spot for form fuzzy bears, okay? You like, like the teddy bears, or you watch the Muppets growing up, or whatever it is, okay? And you feel bad for that bear because it's caught in the bear trap. And you see that it's suffering. So you want to help the bear. So you start to go up to the bear to try to release it. But the bear does what as you approach? Starts swinging at you. Because it doesn't know who you are. They don't know if you're trying to help or trying to hurt. So he starts swinging at you. So you try to help, but he won't let you help. Because he, every time you come to here, he goes crazy on you. So you think to yourself, how can I best help this bear? How can you help this bear? Well, you look in your truck, and you have a tranquilizer gun. So you pull out that gun, and you think to yourself, I'm going to do the most loving thing possible to this bear, which is shoot him. Because I can't get near him to help him, so I have to shoot him. Now I'm this bear, and I'm in this thing, this bear trap, and you're coming at me with a weapon like you must hate me. And I hate you too. Because you're trying to, you said you wanted to help me. And you gave me that warm, fuzzy face. And now you're just trying to shoot me. And there you go, you shoot me. And I hate you. And then, as you come near me, in order to release the tension from the bear trap, okay, you actually have to close it to open it. Okay, you have to push it closed to open it. Okay? So now I'm the bear and I'm kind of groggy. And all of a sudden I feel the pain in my leg getting even worse because this thing is squeezing me more. And I look up and lo and behold, it's the guy with a gun. And now I really hate you. And I'm thinking to myself, you tell me that you're trying to help me because you're saying, no, don't worry and I'll help you. All you're doing, like you are the one who's hurting me. Why are you hurting me? And you're thinking to yourself, man, I ain't trying to hurt you, I'm trying to help you. Watch me on this one. Watch me on this one. The difference in understanding between you and a bear is nothing compared to the difference in understanding between you and God. The difference in understanding between you and a bear is nothing compared to the difference in understanding between you and God. Another story I just thought of, actually. The hardest thing I've ever done as a dad. The hardest thing I've ever done as a dad. My kid has, my kid has, uh, my son had uh, reflux. Okay, y'all know kids have reflux, okay? And a lot of kids are born with reflux, and that makes them, like, throw up and stuff like that. And he had it pretty bad, okay, when he was a newborn. Thank God for my wife, she can clean up throw up, I can't, Okay. He had it bad to the point where the doctor tried the medicine, the medicine did nothing. And then we tried another medicine that did nothing. It was just, it was a tough time. And then the doctor said, we're going to need to do an endoscopy, okay, which is basically stick a tube this way. My kid is like less than a year old at this time, okay. I want to say he was probably, it's probably around that year mark, okay. So we say, okay, you know, like the doctor says, it's not a big deal whatsoever, but he's going to need full anesthesia. I say, okay. Like I trust the doctor, like it's not a big deal. Everyone says it's not a big deal. But the big deal is how they put the kid to anesthesia. They put him on this table, and I think we're just gonna like sit there and watch him. And they start to put this thing on his head, and he's resisting, and he's resisting, like he doesn't want it. He can sense danger. So they say, excuse me, sir, I need you to hold his hands down so I can put him to sleep. So I automatically jump, okay, yes sir, like, yes sir, like you're in charge, and I hold him down. And I'm telling you, I looked in my son's eyes, you know anesthesia, like you're basically dying, okay? Like they're putting you to sleep. And I looked in his eyes, one-year-old eyes. He looked at me like, Dad, how you do this to me? You're killing me. And I'm telling you, that ain't easy. And I'm telling you, me and Marianne sat in that waiting room. Again, dead silence. 
dead silence. We just put our kid to sleep. And of course, everything's okay. Like, everything's fine. Like, don't, don't be on edge. Like, he's fine, okay? <laughs> <laughs> he's healthy now. He's, he's great, all right? But my point is, sometimes as a father, you got to look in your son's eyes. You got to say, I know this is killing you, but I got to do it for you. Maybe God is looking at you with those same eyes. And you're resisting, you're kicking, you're screaming. And then you see your father come over. You're like, okay, dad's going to help me. Dad's going to knock this guy out. Like, show him what's up. Like, get me off of this thing. And dad joins his team. And dad holds you down. And I can't. And you're supposed to be the one who helped me. And this... I love this verse from Genesis chapter 50. That I believe that all day one of, all, every, all of us will one day say this verse. Joseph is the one who's saying it's the end of his very difficult life. Okay, you think you lived a tough life? Man, go read the story of Joseph. Joseph, you, like you think your brothers picked on you? Man, they throw the guy in a well. Okay? Like me and my brothers, we used to fight all the time. Like we punch each other, we hit each other. We, we knew there's boundaries. You don't throw each other in wells. Okay? Like that's just, you, you just don't do that. Okay? You really get in trouble if you do something like that. He got thrown in a well, sold as a slave. And at the end of his life, in front of his brothers, he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about, it is this day to save many people alive. I think one day, we will all say that to God. And the ones who can say it today, blessed are you if you can say that to God today. All right, so we covered two markers, and one of them had some sub-markers there. So we said, first of all, okay, don't worry, I'm going to roll through quicker on these next two. We said the first one is that God is not the creator of evil and suffering. God is not the creator of bad. God created only good. I created bad. All right? Not Adam and Eve. I created bad. There's bad in my life. Majority of the time, the root cause is me. Okay? I'm the one who created it. Number two, that even though I did create bad in my life, God can use the bad for good. And we just saw three ways. To make me more like Christ, to discipline me, and to, uh, what, was the third, what was the first one? Draw me to repentance. Okay, very good. Now the third one. Third and fourth one. I only got four of them. Third and fourth we're going to move quicker through. Evil will one day be judged. Today, we live, good and evil exists. And God allows that. Make no mistake. There will be a day. There will be a day where evil will be no more. Evil will be judged. The prince of darkness will be cast down. And the children of light will reign victoriously with their king in his kingdom. And that day is coming. That day is not here yet. But that day will come. Now, you may think to yourself, if God's going to destroy evil someday, why not today? Like if God has the power to destroy it, why doesn't he do it right now? So that we can enjoy this life and live in peace during this life. Okay? Well, to answer that question, I'll say two things. First thing I'm going to say is, you cannot judge God before the end of the story. Can you go to a movie, watch the first 30 minutes of it, and then walk out and say, you know what? The people who made that movie, I mean, they just left a lot of loose ends. Okay? Like, <laughs> like nothing really came together by the end. No! You can't read half a book and say it doesn't make sense. So we're right now in the halfway through the story. We're not in the end of the story yet. We're still in the middle of the book. And yes, at this point in time in the book, not everything has been tied together. And the good guys haven't won yet. And the bad guys are not destroyed yet. But just wait till the end of the book. And then at the end of the book, if you want to judge the author, feel free. But I have a bet. I have a good guess that by the time we get to the end of this book, no one will be able to open their mouth and say that God was not fair. Just trust me. Get to the end of the book. The second thing I'll say is why doesn't God end the book sooner? For whose sake does God keep the story going? For whose sake? For his sake? 2 Peter 3.9. We looked at this verse before. So the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. But he is long-suffering towards us all, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is the story continued on? Because God wants people to repent. And God, and I'm making this up, so don't take this as, this is the reality. I'm just totally making this up. And God's saying, okay, now it's time for the end. Oh, but 
Chin and repent again. I, I can't, I cannot live in eternity without her. So, one more date. Give me one more chance. Okay, we made her repent. Great, she's part of the kingdom now. She, her name's written in the book of life. Oh, but I just, I, just one more day. Just one more day. Because I got to get this person to repent. See, we joke and we laugh and we make light of this repentance stuff. And the priest stands up here and he says, everyone should confess. And we just hear blah, 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 blah. We don't make, we don't, we don't make light of repentance. Repentance is the door to salvation. How can there be the kingdom of God? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. If there is no repentance, there's no kingdom of God. We're not, we're not, make, we're not looking for customers on Saturday nights because we have quota to fulfill. People, we want to repent because we want people's name in the book of life. And that's why God hasn't ended the story yet. Maybe it's for you. Maybe God is delaying the entire end of the universe to give you one more chance. Mark talked about the prodigal son. Maybe he's giving you one more chance to come home. Come home. Come home. It stinks out there with them pigs. Come home. And that actually gets us to our last one. I told you I'd go quicker. Make no mistake about it. That whatever suffering you have in the world today, our current suffering pales in comparison to the future reward. It ain't even close. What we see today, I'm not saying that to tell you, suck, like I'm not Coach Woolsey, like I talked about last night. I'm not telling you that your suffering is easy and your life is easy. No, your life is hard. I agree. You have a tough life. I'm not trying to make light of it for one second. But what I'm saying is, the, the toughness that you have today will pale in comparison to the reward that you will see tomorrow if you remain faithful. This isn't my words. St. Paul said this in Romans 8, 18. He said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present day are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I prepare, what, or I uh, consider that the suffering of this present day is nothing compared to what will be revealed to us. And exceeding an eternal weight of glory, he says later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me tell it to you this way. Imagine this. Imagine this. And I'm doing my best to not jump up here. Like if you see me, every time I do this, it means I'm about to jump up. But I'm being good. Okay? I get excited about this stuff. If you don't get excited when you talk about heaven, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what you're doing. You don't, it means you don't know about heaven. If you don't get excited when you think and talk about heaven, that means you have no concept of what it is. Okay? Because it's exciting stuff. Okay? Imagine this. Imagine on January 1st of the new year, January 1st, you have the worst day ever. Worst day ever. Driving into work, get a flat tire. Get to the office, get laid off. You got a, a, a dentist appointment at lunch, you think you're going for a checkup, you walk out with a root canal. On the way home from the dentist, you get into a car accident, you smash your car. You get out of the car and you discover that the car that you ran into is your wife's car. You smashed her car too. <laughs> like the worst day possible. Worst day from start to finish. That's January 1. And then let's say January 2 rolls around. In January 2, everything flips. Best day ever. You got a rich uncle who you didn't like. He died. And he left you all his money. And you now think of what? A hundred million dollars. That's how you got a hundred million dollars you just made today. You, your car was broken and your wife's car was broken. But all of a sudden you get a letter in the mail that's saying that you just won a lottery, whatever it is. And you get to have as many new cars as you want. And you get to trade them in whenever you want. Like all the cars in the world that you want. You were sick, the sickness got healed. Your parents were sick, their sickness got healed. Your house had a flood. You discovered that actually the whole house would be torn down. Your insurance is going to pay to build you a new mansion instead of it. The best day in the whole wide world. Your, your football team goes to the Super Bowl and they name you as the MVP even though you're not even in the game. <laughs> best day ever. And this is just the beginning. Let's say January 3 is the same. 4 is the same. 5 is the same. All of February, all of March, all of April, all the 365 days for the rest, or 364 minus January 1st, all the next 364 days are the best days ever. And you get to December 31st. 
and someone says, hey, how was your year? How many people would say, you know, January 1st was just a rough day? <laughs> you wouldn't even remember it. You wouldn't even remember it. You will live on this earth for 50 years more, 60 years, 70, I don't know how many years you're on this earth. And they might be tough. And I'm not trying to make light of, your, of the toughness of your life. I understand that. Everyone's got stuff. I got stuff. You got stuff. We all got stuff. Everyone thinks their stuff is the worst. Everyone's got stuff. But this life will end. And the ratio of the time on that side to the time on this side is greater than the ratio that I just gave you of 364 to 1. When we're in heaven, we're on that side, all of our sufferings on this side will be less than a blip on a radar. I think of it, richest man in the world, Warren Buffett. Let's say, what our suffering in this world, compared to our glory over there, would be the equivalent of Warren Buffett losing a $20 bill. <laughs> he dropped a $20 bill in the toilet when he went to the bathroom. Okay? He'll, he'll survive. And we one day will do what this verse tells us right here. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Is that a nice verse? Say it with me. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Man, I know I told you like a hundred times I said memorize this verse. And memorize this verse. And the church gives us this verse. Y'all know when we say this verse in the church? Here we know. When you attend Vespers on Saturday nights, okay, and we talk about the prayer for the departed. In the litany of the departed, we say this. Because we remind ourselves that departing this world is a promotion. Departing this world is a promotion. If you're ready. And that's why I said come home. And that's why I said it's time to repent. And that's why I'm asking you. Okay, I'm saying from my heart to your heart. Okay, I don't know who you are. I'm, I'm here today. I'm gone tomorrow. You don't got to do nothing for me. Okay? I'm nothing. But maybe God, maybe God is trying to speak to you today. And maybe God had a message for you. Maybe that message is that there is a solution for the evil and suffering in the world. There is a solution. But Father Anthony doesn't have it. I don't have it. You don't have it. But you know who has it? Jesus has it. And that's what he said in John 16, 33. He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. The world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I can't answer why the bad stuff is happening, but I can tell you this. It's your choice what you do with the bad stuff. You can choose to be bitter, choose to be miserable, you can choose to question God, or you can choose to trust God. And you can choose to say, God, I don't know how I'm going to get up to the top of this mountain, but I'm going to stay in this boundary line, I'm going to follow these markers. And I trust I'm going to get to that top of that mountain. And I'm going to see you up there. Because you, Lord, you, Lord, you came down to this earth and you lived a tough life. And you lived a tougher life than I lived. And you bore my weakness so that I could have your strength. You took on my sinful so that I could have your glorious righteousness. You became like me so that you could give me what is yours. And if you're trying to answer any of these questions, I talk about four questions here. You're trying to answer any of these questions outside of our Lord Jesus Christ, good luck to you. I wish you the best. You're going to have no answers. But in him, we find all the answers to all the questions. My hope and my prayer for you is that you will find the answer that you're looking for in him. Glory be to God forever.